Hi, everyone. I'm going to cl close us out of this session. So my name is David Stamps. I'm a second year in communication, and I'm excited to present today. So um, right before we started the academic year, um, I asked Dr. Barry if I could participate in the TA training. So we had a flock of just brand new t uh, grad students come in who are all going to be TA. And she asked, well, what do you want to lead a session on? And I was like, identity. How do you walk into a classroom and how do you negotiate identity? How do you help other students explore their lived experiences? How do you bring your lived experiences to the room and celebrate that? And she was like, sounds good. I love it. Put you in a classroom. It is seated about 35 people. Make sure you print out about 40 pieces of paper for handouts. Got it. Showed up to that room. There were 173 people there <laughs> sitting on the floor all over the place. And so I just kind of did one of these things. And what I realized, though, identity mattered. People were interested. They were afraid of how do I walk into a room, no matter what I'm teaching, statistics or ethnic studies, and help people explore their identity? How can I be unapologetic about my identity? How can I let people know that who they are matters in a space where they might not normally see themselves or in a space where they might not normally see me? And so we had this rich conversation. And the room was like 1,000 degrees. There were so many bodies in there. And I'm just sweating, and we're talking. But it was so good and so rich. And so what I realized were the differences were like, well, I'm an international student. How do I bring in my culture? And I was like, and so there was all this different feedback going on. And the great thing was people started talking to each other and bringing their lived experience. And I was like, this is what we do. You walk in with your lived experience, and then you allow other people to embrace their lived experience. And then you find ways to apply that in different ways. And so that was kind of the, br uh, the beginning of this kind of exploration of like, I know my identity, and I'm unapologetic, but I want to make sure my students are as well, no matter what walk of life, no, no matter how they're socialized. And so that's where this kind of came from. And so with that, this is a great quote I found that said, that to inspire thoughtful engagement with issues related to identity, it is necessary that instructors model vulnerability and risk taking. And this was the scary part. If I'm going to walk into a space and realize, for me specifically, that I am probably, even though the power dynamic has shifted, I'm also the minority in the room. So how can I explore who I am, give other students the agency to explore who they are, and to facilitate rich, engaging conversations, knowing that I'm going to have to be vulnerable? No one might have to take some risk. And I'll give you a random example. Uh, I'm also an adjunct faculty at SBCC, so I get a chance to play around in both, uh, in both places. And I remember we talked about ethnocentrism. And I defined the term, and we're talking about this rich concept. And everyone was asking questions. And it was going great. I was like, I am on fire today. And I had a student raise their hand. I was like, yes, Max, what can I do for you? And he said, well, ethnocentrism, according to you, is when you put like your identity is better than everyone else, or everyone should conform to your identity. And I was like, you're on the right path. What we got, Max? He's like, it sounds like Black Lives Matter is exercising ethnocentrism. And I was like, ooh, here we go. Here we go. He was like, it sounds to me more that all lives matter is inclusive, right? And the whole class was like, shh. <laughs> and so it was, this rich, it was this rich engagement where I had to be a little vulnerable, and I had to take a risk to really engage, because Max, I think, had a very thoughtful question. Here we are now, week 15, and he's still there, and I'm still there, so I think we're OK. And I was like, but here's where we're going to go one step further, Max. We're going to be critical thinkers. We're going to do research. We're going to delve in. Because you can type in Black Lives Matter, go to blacklivesmatter.org, and understand the mission and the goal and what they're subscribing to and what their purpose is. And you can probably type in All Lives Matter and also get some information that will tell you another narrative. And so things on the surface say one thing. It just came on. Things on the surface say one thing, but now we can be more critical and get really rich and engaged. And, what I, and why I share that with you is because what Max got was that if David's going to be unapologetic about his identity, then I can ask questions. I can get further understandings. I can go deeper and richer in a place where I might not be able to if, this, if there wasn't an environment where it was OK to be uncomfortable and vulnerable and take risks. And so and it happens a lot. So that's something to look forward to. But that, that's the kind of space that I want to create, and I want to encourage everyone in this room to also create, where you can be unapologetic, but that means being vulnerable and taking risks, because that allows for everyone to be sharp in some way, in some way shape, and how. And so in addition to that, I thought it's important to understand who we are as educators, because research lets us know that our identities, no matter how hard we try, come into the room with us no matter what. So when we acknowledge them, we open up the space. Because again, we see here that who you are matters in that space. And it could be to your detriment or your benefit, depending on how you position it. And so research tells us that when you walk into a space, if you are a minority, if you're underprivileged, if you're underrepresented, some things that may come about is the idea that your authority and your knowledge will be challenged or your classroom effectiveness may be questioned, or there may be challenges to the validity of your scholarship and your research, or there may be resistance from people who don't look like you. 
And so I've learned, I'm bringing my own experience, the best way to get in front of some of that is to walk in leading with that. Hi everyone, I'm a black male, I'm cisgender, I'm a father, I'm a partner, I'm a first generation college student. And what you realize, students go, is that what we're going to do now? Like, Absolutely. <laughs> we're going to engage and, 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 and real, realize who we are matters. And that we're all different and that's OK. So that when I bring in my knowledge, when I bring in my scholarship, it's from my point of view. And when you ask me questions, it's from your point of view. And that's OK in this space. And so I try to lead with that. And I'm four years now into this, and it's working out OK, so we'll see what happens. But what it means is that these are assumptions, stereotypes, and stigmas. How do we start to dismantle and unpack that? Because no matter what your lived experience is, whether you're a woman in STEM or you're a black male and we only make up 1.8% of the population as far as faculty at, at uh, predominantly white institutions, no matter what your lived experience is, there's a potential that there might not be no one who looks like you. How do you get in front of that? Acknowledge the elephant in the room so that we can start with a clean slate engaging realistically who we are. And so I want to go one step further now that I have this knowledge. Let's do some research. And so what I did was I actually took my, uh, a couple of my classes and I gave them the opportunity to engage with identity and power dynamics and communication practices. And so I told my students, it's all anonymous, but I want you to engage with me on what you thought when you first walked into the room, what you've learned in the past seven, six, seven weeks, and in how or, or why or how both did you, in, did you have to step into that, un, uh, to that difficult space and engage? How did you do it? Why did you do it? What were some of the outcomes? And so I used an interpretive interaction as a method because it allowed me to bring my lived experience to the research. So where it might not be generalizable, it can absolutely be uplifting. It might not be generalizable, but it can actually give someone else agency. And so I really want to tap into a method that gave me that. In addition, it allowed me to speak to lived experiences that are sometimes missing from scholarship. And that also needs to happen. And my, the makeup of, of my population was similar to most predominant institutions, especially in California. Uh, it was about, I, I want to say, uh, half female, half male. It was majority white, followed by uh, Lat Latino, Asian. Then there was some speckles of um, African American and Middle Eastern uh, students. So it was a really interesting, diverse group of people. So I was really interested to see what I would get out of this. 30% were first generation, and 99.9% of them had never had a black male faculty member before in their entire career. K through 12 and at this university. So I was like, this is going to be good. <laughs> and so really quickly, because I want to give us a, a chance to engage, here's how I kind of broke out the themes. And so this was telling for me personally. Most people, because my name is David Stamps, assumed I was old and white. And so when I walked to the classroom, they didn't know I was a professor. So it was interesting that they had to immediately renegotiate their thoughts and ideas of what happens at a predominantly white institution in a classroom setting. And for a lot of them, that was jarring. They didn't understand what was going to happen. They didn't understand what to understand. Every class they've ever had, it was a white um, teacher. And in most of their classes, it was a white male. What do you do with this uncertainty? And we know that stereotypes and stigmas absolutely tap into uncertainty. I don't know what you are, I know who you are. I need to rely on what I've seen in the media, or what I've been told by my parents, or what society has told me. And so that was something I had to confront with my identity in the room. In addition to that, uh, a lot of my students mentioned this, that you know, I thought you were so young and so cool. And a few people said, and I wasn't sure if you were going to be able to teach me anything. And they link the idea of my youthfulness, my exuberance, as lacking skills to engage in rich dialogue as a teacher. Some that I didn't know I walked in with. I know I'm young and cool. I know that. <laughs> but I didn't know that they actually embrace it as like, well, can he actually teach? He doesn't look like a teacher. He doesn't act like a teacher. He probably is not a good teacher. And then the last thing I got, um, this was for me personally, was this idea that he makes me feel comfortable and I expect that. I expect for him to shuck and jive. I expect for him to entertain me. And I was telling one of my students today this, because we were just walking. He's like, what are you going to talk about today? And I told him. And he was like, but what's wrong with that? And I was like, well, my job, first and foremost, is to educate you, not to entertain you. And so if that's your expectation, when you look at me, because this, this is where they got that from. We had just met that very first day. And so when I let you down, what happens to the dynamic in the classroom? When I have to give you that C because you didn't spend your time writing that paper because it was more about me entertaining you. What do I do when you question my knowledge and my scholarship because of my identity? And so I realized, having engaged in a very, in a very first workshop that identity matters, 
that I need to understand what, how my identity is perceived in rooms, how I can negotiate that, how, can, how I can navigate that, and then ideally come into spaces like this to let everyone else know that there are ways to get in front of it, there are ways to confront it, and one of those ways is to acknowledge it day one and then to allow students, no matter what their ethnic background, their gender identity, their sexual orientation, their first generation status, if they're documented or undocumented, that it's okay to be you, to ask questions, and ideally we will all learn and grow. With that, thank you. So we have about four minutes if anyone has any questions for David. Thank you so much. That it's a great talk. Um, just uh, you know about your young and cool. So <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. Um, and I also feel like that's something you know maybe people. Do you think some of those will become an obstacle because they will you know less respectful and you know sometimes you're being. Do you have those experience that you're too nice or too close to them so they're not like doing their work they're trying to you know you know that kind of thing and how do you deal with that that's a that's a great question um so here's the interesting I'll, I'll use a real example so i am wrapping up the semester at santa barbara city college so i had a lot of tears yesterday and a lot of people died no one died um but what i realized because the truth is and you all might not know this i am twice i am twice the age of the average student in my classroom so I just look good, but I'm, I am not their age at all, at all. Like the average student, my, the average student in my classroom is 18 and a half, and I'm, I'm almost 38. So we're, 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 I am their parents' age. So it's, an, it's based off of what they see, the artifacts and, and my idea when I walk into the room. So we, we're not, like when they talk about their music, I'm like, that just sounds like ruckus. Like we don't have anything in common. <laughs> we have nothing in common. And so it's what they assume. And, I've, and I, I was walking to my car yesterday after hearing the sob stories because the, the semester was about to end. I was talking to my partner and I was like, I don't know what to do because I lead my classrooms being who I am. And I, I try to impart knowledge. I tell my students, I'm going to give you all the tools you need to succeed. If you use these tools well, you will succeed. That's just how it works. It's, there is no hidden agenda for me in this room. However, how do I get in front of the fact that they think I'm their age? They think I'm so young and cool. And then that transfers over into, oh, I don't have to do the readings, or I don't have to follow by the deadlines. I'll be honest with you, I haven't figured it out just yet because I'm me. Like, I, I don't, you know, I, I, I try to get my grown-up sweaters out to look a little bit older. I don't know if it's not translating yet, um, but, I, but I'm me. But it is an obstacle that I am thinking about now all the time. Like, I want to be me. I want to have a good time. But that cannot, that cannot translate until you can lax on your work. You can, you can not show up. You can, you can, oh, I didn't do my work. Well, then that's a zero. What are you talking about? We're not at a bar. We're in class. Like you have, and so I, I'm, I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm, I'm keen on my syllabus. And I'm actually mean in my syllabus so that day one I set a strong foundation. And I mean to be relaxed. You know, I say I don't accept late work. And if you leave early, it's an absence. None of that's really true. But I try to set us, and that was, that was one way to combat it. And as I learned yesterday, it didn't really work as well. So now I'm revisiting, how do I set really strong, a really strong foundation in the room? Because I want to be me. I think I'm a good teacher. I love what I do. I love undergrads. But not to their detriment that they don't take me serious enough to learn and grow and do their work and show that they're responsible young adults. So I'm still figuring it out. Thank you again, David. Um, if you want to talk to him afterwards, feel free.